Greetings everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here as we explore the first few weeks, if not months, of what a presidential Robert McNamara would be like. The Giant Awakes. My fellow Americans, I stand before you today having taken the oath of office that our forefathers have taken for nearly two centuries. Within many of our lifetimes, we will see, or we will live to see, a third millennium. Before the celebration of such milestones, it is important to reflect on how our nation is and how it shall be. I swear to you, America, we will be a greater nation upon the celebrations. America, for decades, our government has been plagued by inefficiency, wasteful, expensive, and otherwise useless programs that have weighed down the true strength of our nation. For many years, this incompetence was not so important, for the nation was strong and our enemies were few. Now, however, when we are constantly standing up, Upon the precipice of conflict with foreign powers, such programs cannot be afforded. America must stand strong, undivided, and without frivolous distraction if we are to outlast our enemies. Beyond pure survival, though, let us rejoice that should our almighty God give us strength, I believe that we shall rise into a new age of American prosperity, taxes, and the infernal and wasteful IRS shall be streamlined. Hundreds of thousands of new jobs will be created, and near every American shall be able to purchase a home and live in peace. You may hear these and believe them to be lofty goals, but I say they are quite achievable. All we need to do is trim the fat from government, and the work is one united people hail to the chief. In which we have the Amherst presidency. Oh, and actually, we have the ability to go one way. Or another. Interesting. Robert McNamara is not one who anyone would consider a charismatic politician. He's a numbers guy. Having studied economics at the University of California, Berkeley, and got an MBA at Harvard before the war, and then serving in the Army Air Corps. He wasn't a pilot or a frontier or frontline officer, but conducted statistical analysis of bombers' effectiveness, even as the Japanese pushed the Americans across the Pacific. After the war, and ascending the upper levels of management at the Ford Motor Company, McNamara joined the government service, working in the Department of Defense under multiple administrations, doing his best to make the U.S. military the most efficient and effective in the world. Now having experience in both the private sector, and turned the military into a finely honed machine ready to stand up to the Reich and the rising sun. He is ready to bring that experience to the nation as a whole, with a young popular Birch Bay as his vice president handling the more public events. McNamara can do what he does best, crunching the numbers, find efficiencies, and turning the American government into a finely honed machine. Cool, and I guess we can... Security Minister? Ah, uh, McNamara. Careful analysis will win this cold war. His cold, hard practicality. Cutting down on wasteful government spending and reallocating the funds to the military. <sighs> Sounds perfect. Even though right now, uh, we have a little bit of debt. 8%, 1.4. Actually, in, th in this universe, it's actually really cool. Ooh, it's auto-saving. That we do have, actually, a pretty good uni union in South Africa. And let's see, who actually won against... Yeah, Borman won again. That's unfortunate. Rex Commissariat, that's also in here. As well as the Russian Federative Republic under Yeltsin. A very weird timeline, I know. And Kazakhstan is here as well, so. Mm, cool. Let's do some of that. That'd be fine with me. We can have a presidency. Can we... That, does he not have a security minister? Like, I guess he doesn't. We have Donald Rumsfeld. Ah, huh. A warmonger. Huh. Getting to work. Vice President Birch Bay wasn't surprised to see Robert uh, McNamara, the president, already settled in the Oval Office by precisely 7.45 a.m. writing minuscule notes on, in the margins of his intelligence briefing. You still haven't taken a day off since the election, Bob. Bay took the chair opposite the president, besides Thanksgiving and Christmas. I don't see why I should, McNamara said, settling or setting the briefcase or briefing aside and helping himself to a military readiness report from the voluminous stack of folders on the desk. Americans expect the president to be working, not basking in past glories. Bay suppressed a frown. McNamara always had been a hard worker, maybe too much, more at home with numbers and people. He'd taken the RDs by surprise by announcing a run for the presidency in 71 and floored everyone by actually winning and mustering a charisma that had been hidden during his days as Nixon's Treasury Secretary. The phone rang. Bay froze as McNamara picked up the receiver before breaking into a wide smile. President Bennett, no, no, thank you for all your help on the campaign trail. You don't know how much your help meant. McNamara's practiced amiability and natural confidence smoothed Bay's fears for an instant until McNamara hung up inside irritably, turning back to his papers with his mind buried in his familiar world of statistics, leaving the vice president to thumb through his own notes in an awkward silence. Like a lockwork, America moves forward. Failing the government, the first call the new government is the new president is making is to George Schultz, a successful businessman who has served in the several government roles over the previous decades, included on Eisenhower's Council of Economic Advisors, Secretary of Labor under Nixon, and an economic policy commentator and advisor over the years. This time, Schultz will be given the Treasury Department to run, so he'll have some real power to go with his suggestions and plans. He also has strong opinions on foreign policy of the anti-fascist variety. Should he make uh, getting any budget increases, we propose in the future to run through the bureaucracy that much smoother. Pretty cool. And it's interesting that we can go work with a party, do uh, appease the Republicans, rally the Democrats, and appoint Rusk. Now, I guess with this 
this particular video, I will do both. We'll go through one side first, and then we'll do the other side once we get rolling up our sleeves. So, we'll see what happens. Let's see. Anything else interesting in this one? Republic of Finland looking pretty thick. Italy is in the OFN again. And the Spanish Republic actually won in Spain. Go figure. Fill in the government. I want to read what event that has first. And the Imperial City of Iran. And we also have the oil crisis too. Cool. George B. Schultz had just finished reading through the week's copy of the American Economic Review, yawning in the study of the Sh Chicago town's house, when his wife peered in from the doorway, wise eyes wide. George, the president's calling. That was more than enough to rouse Schultz from his evening topor, and he hurried over to the living room. Bob, it's been a while. Nine years almost, President McNamara's voice came through a crisp and precise, when Nixon was still president and when you were working on the question of seniorage, inflation, and the silver shortage in the treasury. Yes, exactly, Schultz marveled at how McNamara could recall the precise details of someone else's work all those years later, but I'm guessing that's not what you wanted to talk about. No, McNamara was blunt as ever. I want you to be my treasury secretary, George. Someone who already knows how all the numbers fit together. George blinked, or Schultz blinked. Why me? Surely McNamara had enough friends in the private sector to not rely on a washed-up Nixon-era academic. I need people who know the numbers and who will tell it to me straight. The silence, followed by McNamara clearing his throat uneasily. People who I can trust? It's got to be you. When do I start? George Schultz, that's cool. Alright, so we got that guy. Now, for this part of the video, we're going to go down with working with the party. Since we won the election as a Republican Democrat, it's only reasonable, prudent, and even that we should be working within our coalition. First on the agenda is giving the military the resources it needs in order to improve itself. While we can always find more ways to cut inefficiencies and waste, sometimes more money for more training, recruits, and planes and boats is necessary. Then, once we have the muscle to flex, we can take an even longer line against the Germans who only respond to force. Well, by God, we're going to have force. Cool. So we'll go down one way, and then we'll go down the other way, and see what happens. Budget-wise, hopefully we can slash this a little bit more. And let's see. Oh, and we, here he is. George Schultz, a laissez-faire capitalist. Cool. He was a whiz kid, apparently. And then Donald Trump spelled, as we saw earlier, warmonger. Hmm. And, of course, we have Vice President Bay, who does what? He's a liberal democracy, happy, am happy amateur. Okay, sure, yeah, why not? Let's see, who do we consider? Well, conservative democracy, cool. Working with the party, rally the Democrats. The president is not a public speaker. McNamara's a numbers guy, and you can't convince stats with powerful words, nor can you change mathematical facts with soaring rhetoric. Ed's words will never enter the pantheon of great American speeches like Washington, Kennedy, or Lincoln. But when he does have something to say, and something that he can't simply hand a bag to do, then it has to be important. And the same page to support his administration is just one such effort. While the speech he was giving to the Democrats invited to the East Room is full of cliches, the best is yet to come. And a couple awkward turns of phrases, it won't be easy, it will be hard, it will may even be difficult. There's no doubt of the sincerity behind it, and his ideological allies are all the more supportive that he ha at least made the effort, putting on a nice face. I'm surprised you called, George McGovern said, F self efficacingly sitting opposite the president. I thought the man with the plan didn't have much use for career politicians. That's all in the past, McNamara replied smoothly. We're all in this to win the Cold War, but I have my blind spots. It's only natural to ask for help covering the bases. About that, McGovern replied hesitantly. You keep talking about winning the Cold War. I'm worried that we'll abandon everything decent about America getting there. McNamara blinked. What makes you think that? Well, take this fight and fascism abroad business. South Africa stretched us to the limit, and we're just starting to come to terms with a generation of soldiers relieving or reliving the horrors of the Veldt every waking moment, McGovern sighed. How many boys are we going to send into quagmires abroad when we can't even take care of our veterans at home? We just need to find the right men, McNamara replied em emphatically. McGovern's eyes widened. That's not what I meant. On the contrary, we find the right people who will fight for America with a smile on their face and combat the stress incidents should plummet. McNamara's face lit up excitedly, even as McGovern struggled visibly to keep his composure. At least he's talking to the party now. Oh, uh, you know how you can find more men? Look up, you guys should look up Project 100,000, 100,000, and see what McNamara was cooking up when he was, uh, when, when he was around, especially during the 60s. It was, hmm, that's the way you get more men, apparently, according to him. Security Minister, after we're going to rally the Democrats, we're going to appease the Republicans. While the Democrats may be on the upswing now that McNamara's in office, that doesn't mean that we can ignore the Republicans and their needs and desires entirely. In fact, that would make running the government that much harder and fictitious. And that's the last thing the new president wants. Vice President Bay has already has an idea in mind to work with the GOP, the University and Small Business Patent Procedures Act. Ever since the federal government started giving grants to the universities to develop new technology, the debate over who actually owns intellectual rights to the new developments has been a fraught one. 
This new bill will stream streamline it by giving the universities a chance to patent and profit off these inventions since they did all the hard work. And the president is all for giving those that hard work other work hard on ideas and technologies to improve America's security and standard of living the right to prosper thanks back to them. Finding some common ground between the two parties will help keep and promote unity. Let's see, we have the Iran War right now. Who are we doing? We all oh, the RDs are actually collapsed. Uh, but whatever. So, to get McNamara, you start off with Tricky Dick Nixon, right? Then you gotta go to Bennett. And then I went with MCS, was it Margaret Chase Smith? And then I got McNamara. Dealing in favors, Vice President Bay entered the Oval Office to find President McNamara uncharacteristically still in a seat, his mind racing behind closed eyes and steeple fingers. You wanna see me, Bob? Just thinking about the first thing to send to Congress, McNamara said, eyes opened. There's so much we could do. Do you think the Republicans would support increases in defense research funding? Without a Secretary of Defense in place, the Pentagon wouldn't know what to spend the funding on, even if they got it. Bay ran his hand through his hair. We ought to start small with achievable and popular goals. That way, while favors to call on when the big bills start coming. And you've got a few ideas already? Bay nodded. Senator Dole and I were working on a bill to speed up the process of turning federally funded research into actual practical results. The federal government sits on a trove of academic and private research and does nothing with it. Less than 5% of federal research patents are ever commercialized. McNamara di digested Bay's words. We're going to do a patent legislation. Are you sure we can get Republicans on board? You'd be surprised how many people suffer from because of the knowledge to say them is tied up in red tape, Bay remarked. If we do this for them, they'll thank us later. All right, what type of bill we sent it through Congress? Let's see, 18, 9, 5, and 8. Well, that doesn't seem very good. No room, no room, no room, no room. Well, that sucks. Ooh, that is not good. Now, that's math. 26 plus, that's, that's only 40. And the bill, the bill fails. Well, that sucks. An hour after the vote, President McNamara was huddled with Vice President Bay in the Oval Office digesting the results. I don't get it, McNamara muttered. This was supposed to be non-controversial. Technical legislation on research patents. It's about spurring innovation in the American economy. How is Congress not on board with this? It seems like we've got more enemies in Congress than we thought, Bay responded quietly. He hadn't expected the defeat of his bill either. Senator Dole had called him angrily after the bill died on the Senate floor after hours of amendments, all for not. All we're trying to do is make life easier for American inventors. And all Congress can do is uh, bitch and moan, McNamara swore uncharacteristically. Now we'll look like idiots and Congress won't let us forget. We'll just have to try harder next time, in which I want to see what happens if we are successful. All right, everyone, the, and the bill passes after an hour after the vote. President McNamara was huddled with the Vice President Bay in the Oval Office digesting the results. Complete success, Bay Crown. Senators Dole's in the bill sailed through Congress in its original form. No changes and no hiccups in procedure. Proper planning can overcome any challenge, Birch, McNamara replied simply, flipping through his notebook. We'll do the same for the rest of the legislative program. Bay had expected McNamara to be more pleased. Getting a bill through Congress without a change was a, was a significant accomplishment in its own right. Instead, the President was already hard at work drafting the next step in his agenda. You just gotta keep your eyes on the future, Bob, Bay remarked. I'll make sure that the RDs are in line to make it happen. Great. Appoint Rusk. One of the hardest working men currently in the U.S. government is Dean Rusk. Quiet and shy, he has a knack for details and can see many sides of the same issue, coming to the best conclusion after long thought. This is exactly the kind of man we need to oversee the Department of Defense, while Rusk's career so far has been in the State Department. McNamara, I trust him to negotiate the rivalries of the different branches of the military to work together to dual goals of defending America and defending freedom. The only opposition we have faced regarding Rusk's confirmation are the uber-pacifist Republicans like Senator McGovern, but they're the very, very small minority. Then again, they wouldn't like anyone to be sitting in the Pentagon unless they were a hippie, of course. Very nice. And of course, we have a lot of debt, but hey, you know what? Over time, that'll go away. The Kingdom of Morocco looking pretty thick over there. Ooh, death of Supreme Court Justice. If you'd like to read about that, go right ahead. C'est la vie, it is what it is. I've been building a lot of ships or researching a lot of ships. The Asheville class, very nice. And negotiations. Oh, yeah, I had some console commands, as you can see here. Conservative democracy, 100%. He's very popular. I had to use console commands to get, make sure that we pass the bill. So, lay out the vision. With the Republican Democrats firmly behind us, it's time to get to work. The president's been working with senators from both parties on a sweeping bill to provide everything, uh, or billions, to the military to fund up everything from new weapon systems, upgrading technology to become more capable, and investing in bettering the lives of our men in arms. But the largest aspect of the bill is to give the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency the leeway in funds to not only surpass the Germans and Japanese right now, but right in the next century. We will make America not only the strongest nation in the world militarily, but also the most forward-thinking and advanced. Highly recommended. You come highly recommended, Mr. Rusk. McNamara cautiously appraised Artie's nominee for Secretary of Defense, sitting across his desk, truth be told. Rusk had to be the first recommendation of either wing of the party. Like squabbling children, the Republicans and Democrats had vetoed each other's first choice, too partisan to a fault. 
Dean Rusk, the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, a former army officer and a distinguished professor of foreign affairs, was a common second pick of both halves of the RDs. Balding and unassuming at first glance, the party had pitched Rusk to McNamara as a safe and uncontroversial choice for the Pentagon. You know what I stand for, Mr. Rusk. American supremacy against the Germans and the Japanese and in military affairs above all else, McNamara continued test testing Rusk. I want your honest opinion. Can this be done? It's not a matter of can, it's a matter of necessity, Mr. President. Rusk didn't even bat an eye before responding. So many Beltway insiders say that nuclear weapons have made major power war obsolete, Mr. President. But in my experience, the road to fighting fascism starts well before that point. It'll be in the steep, steeps of Manchuria, the South African belt, the jungles of Indi Indonesia. Rusk leaned forward if America wants to win the Cold War. We'll have to fight on the peripheries of the world with everything but nuclear weapons. We'll need a military geared towards fighting anywhere, at any time, and we're, and we're nowhere close to that. Rusk seems like my kind of man. I do say so myself. Civilian austerity? Military austerity? Well, this doesn't seem very fitting for McNamara, but we got slash military spending just for now. Just for a quick think. Lay out the vision and roll up our sleeves. With President McNamara settled into the White House, his agents his agenda said his cabinet filled is in support of the Congress assured it's time. Now that the ground groundwork has been laid, it's time to make official the new McNamara doctrine. It will not be simply an address of the nation like previous presidents have done to outline the foreign policy, but it will become ironclad law. We'll use our democratic institutions to show America's enemies what they will soon be facing. I'll be quivering in my jack boots already. Now we gotta be fruit proofing America's defense. The lights in the cabinet room dimmed as President McNamara surveyed his audience. Bay. Rumsfeld, Schutz, and some grandees of the RD Senate, Bob Dole and Barry Goldwater, all summoned to the White House for the unveiling of McNamara's strategy for America. Gentlemen, McNamara began, the f past few months have shown what is possible when RDs work together for America. Now we start turning our election promises into a reality. It was no different than any other presentation McNamara had given in his lifetime. Whether in a Ford boardroom or in the very same cabinet room, he's always been the man with a plan. Ambitious plans with quantifiable targets, turning vague dreams into hard results. Even now, as a boss of all America and his own captive audience, he saw no reason for that to change. During the election, I said that America was to win the Cold War, not to outlast the Germans and the Japanese. In the last decade, it's proven that when, we, when push comes to shove, the threat of military force remains relevant, even divisive or decisive in the nuclear age. He flipped through the slides, images of South Africa, Indonesia, Egypt, and Iran. Even though American soil has never been in danger for the past decade, American interests are challenged year after year. And if we're to defend American interests, the safety of our allies and our way of life, we must invest in our capabilities accordingly. We shall spare no expense on American supremacy. Now this bill, if it ain't gonna pass, we'll be kind of in a pickle. Let's see, what is this? 29 plus 31. That should pass, right? No room to support. There's absolutely no room for support anywhere. Holy cow. That's 25, 41. Yeah, that's, that's going to pass. Okay, cool. That's my mind. And it doesn't really matter. I'll go with the conservative option since we are part of the conservative democracy. Throw on some of this because it doesn't even matter. Thank you very much. We're almost done rolling up our sleeves. And look at that. Yuck, yes, 3% popularity. Oh, also down here. We got, we're got we doing a lot of stuff here. And the act passes. After a prolonged debate in the Senate, the 1973 Military Readiness Act has passed in the floor vote and is now headed to President McNamara's desk to be signed into law. The first major piece of legislation aimed at fulfilling the President's stated goal to revamp the American military for a decisive victory in the Cold War, the bill embraces the sweeping retooling of the armed forces along with the principles of modern operational research methods. The administration's approach to military affairs is suffused with statistical analysis, analyses, and quantitative methods from the heights of grand strategy to the notes and bolts of equipment procurement, envisioning the expanses of force perfectly for the battlefields of the future. Objections to the bell in the Senate floor were predominantly focused on the cost of, or the cost of Mc, McNamara's military programs, with a force both qualitative, qualitatively and quantitatively superior to its enemies, being prohibitively expensive to field. Administration officials dismiss these concerns, noting that the American people had elected the president with a mandate to ensure American victory in the Cold War, and that the administration employed same statistical methods to ensure cost effectiveness in the pursuit of military superiority. Can McNamara have it all? Expenses will rise sharply. And other things will improve and stay in the course. Oh, cool. So, that is that part of McNamara. So, I'll see you in just a little bit, and we can do time to clean house. All right, everyone, it's time to clean house. One of the problems with the old style of politics was that loyalty to the party and deference to ideology was the most important aspect of governing the nation, even if it didn't actually help America in the long term. President McNamara doesn't believe this. It's inefficient, it values subservience to party more than com co competency in a subject, and leads to infighting and corruption. The best way, the only way to run the country is to get the best people in the right positions, no matter their political leaning. The RDs may moan and complain as their candidates are shunted aside for non political or worse, National Progressive Party members, but it's all for the good of America, nation over party. We end up passing a bill allowing us to have an increased presence in the Middle East. 
American involvement in the Middle East? Oh, that's never done, been done before. Never ever. Well, let's call up Lewis Kids. In his time serving in the Nixon administration, Robert McNamara had developed the professional relationships, even friendships with a variety of young, talented, and incredibly smart men that soon became known as the whiz kids within the federal government. While they didn't have their top roles in government 12 years ago, working as undersecretaries or backroom specialists in analysis, now they are more than qualified to implement modern management systems into the government focused on the fields of economic analysis, operations research, game theory, and computing. Adam Yarmolinsky, William Kaufman, and Charles Rossetti, Rossetti are just a few of the business ex executives and intellectuals that will be given high roles in the government to bring a modern sensibility to the tired mechanics of government. The old timers and civil servants that rely more on patronage and not causing waves that may not be too thrilled to be working under these new radical ideas, but it's the president's decision, not theirs. So they better adapt or get the heck out of the way. At least have some respect for the mainstream politics. Unknown, unknown, Senator Dole. You got a minute? Senator or Secretary of State Donald Rumsfeld whispered to Bob Doe, who beckoned Rumsfeld to follow him into an antechamber. As soon as the two were alone, Rumsfeld held out a list of names. George Schultz and James Schlesinger. Do these names sound familiar to you? Dole shook his head. No? Why? They're academics, one from the University of Chicago, another at Rand. Rumsfeld said disdainfully. They're also his nominees for Treasury's top two positions. The heck they are. What happened to the list from the RD headquarters, Dole roared? Seems like you never read it. Rumsfeld pointed further down the list. Every single cabinet pick... Is out of left field. People we've never heard of. Is is the president serious? Dole's eyes widened. How are we getting all these nobodies through Senate confirmation? Rumsfeld nodded grimly. The president says he's going to clean house. He's going to rush America or run America like Ford. This is Washington, not Detroit. Dole fumed. If you think he can run the RDs like cogs in a machine, he'll be sorely disappointed. Some resistance is, of course, to be expected. But you know what? We're calling up the whiz kids regardless. Politics be gosh darned. The president's primary efforts are all focused on foreign policy in the military. While, yes, the Republicans and Democrats developed the campaign platform on internal affairs, McNamara was going to leave that quagmire up to the vice president and Congress to sort it out. No, nope, he's focused on the big picture, the whole world, you know, the big things. The only other people in Washington that cares as much about foreign policy as McNamara does is a National Progressive Party who is committed to anti-fascism as he is. It may be heretical to the president's own party and may require having to agree to some slashing some welfare or unsustainably increasing it get to one wing or another one side or on side with his foreign policy. But that's for everyone else to worry about. As long as America is united in defense of democracy and freedom abroad, who cares? The best minds of the MPP will be a gosh darn useful asset. Followed up by nominating Jackson to support to show the support or show the MPP that we are serious about wanting their support. We're gonna prove it to them in the best way we can. We're gonna nominate NPPC Senator Henry M. Scoop Jackson as Secretary of Defense. When McNamara said and Jackson have the same viewpoint when it comes to the military and foreign affairs. Germany and Japan are the biggest threats to our way of life. While they may not agree on much else politically, McNamara is willing to overlook that to provide bipartisan support to his agenda. The Republicans may not like it since they aren't going to get one of their guys to be the head of the Pentagon, but it'll play well to the rest of the nation. The charts and polls show that. The hawkish voters of the NPP will appreciate our bipartisanship. New partnerships. Henry Scoop Jackson and Gene Kirkpatrick, the leading hawks of the National Progressive Party Center and far right wings, sat awkwardly opposite President McNamara, who smiled at them both as if it was the most natural thing in the world. We appreciate the invitation, Mr. President, uh, said Jackson, before Kirkpatrick cut straight to the point. I thought that the RDs weren't interested in talking with the NPP. Kirkpatrick returned McNamara's smile with a steely gaze. Now you want to play nice? McNamara's smile hardly wavered. I wouldn't call it playing nice, despite all the differences between our parties. Everyone here agrees on one thing. A strong and assertive foreign policy, especially with uh, Kirkpatrick. Uh, and the other guy, Scoop Jackson, bombs and welfare anybody. What, just because we agree on promoting American interests abroad, we're suddenly going to wash 20 years of differences away, Jackson frowned? The MPP isn't going to be your friend just because you asked, Mr. President. And if you thought this was a total fool's errand, I don't see why... Uh, you would have agreed to come here at all, McNamara leaned back in his chair, but never once broke out of contact with Jackson. I don't see why we can't work with each other. Kirkpatrick and Jackson looked at each other better afoot in the door with someone that they could talk to than an eternity in the wilderness. A partnership of, convi of conviction, not of convenience. Everyone grows more divided. I love it. That's the way we all want to see McNamara. And soon enough, we'll have a s certain scooper. And like earlier, we have the death of a Supreme Court justice. Doesn't matter to us. This, these whole party politic, and that's not going to be us. We got to focus on the big picture, the huge picture. And after we nominate Jackson, and break out the graphs. The most important work that needs to be done, to put frankly, is boring and unglamorous. It's going to be involved a lot of late nights, breaking down numbers, creating charts and formulas, and in the end, 
showing the best and most logical, most efficient way to secure America's defenses and fortunes. The old days of trying to make ideology fade into reality is over. Now we're going to use the cold, hard facts to maximize everything, especially when it comes to the defense. The best place to station aircraft carriers. The most effective way to use flybys to intimidate. The best training methods to ensure the minimization of American casualties and the maximization of our enemies. And if necessary, the loopholes and gray areas of the current laws that we can use to our advantage. Go get a pot of coffee on. It's going to be a long night. Ooh, get more armed professionalism. Research speed will begin at preparing for our lightning strike of our own. An olive branch at the Pentagon. Senator Jackson struggled to hide a surprise. Mr. President, surely you're not so sure of qualified. This is bigger than our parties, Mr. Jackson, the President stated. Working with McGovern's Republicans, doves, is like fighting with one arm tied behind my back. I can't have that. Have you thought about what it would take for the NPP to agree to this? Jackson replied hesitantly. Uh, Kirkpatrick and I are happy to work on specific legislation, but a cabinet position will need some assurances. Name it. McNamara's cut off Jackson. Whatever you need to make the MPP come willingly, you got it. The line fell silent. And why wouldn't it? Here was a president of the U.S. offering a leader in the opposition a blank check. A nagging voice in Jackson's head whispered that he'd inevitably tie his name to whatever the president had planned. And if things went wrong, he'd be down or going down on McNamara's ship. Maybe that wasn't so bad. They both believed in the same things. America primacy abroad. And in exchange, the president was willing to assure prosperity at home. Then why wasn't he getting the better end of the deal? The next morning, Washington and the RD party headquarters in particular received the news of Henry Jackson's nomination to serve as President uh, McNamara's uh, Secretary of Defense with a single resounding cry. What the actual F? <laughs> oh, I love it. I'm going to break up the grass. I mean, we already read this, but it's pretty short anyways. With McNamara settled into the White House, his agenda set his cabinet filled, supporting Congress is sure. It's time. Now that the groundwork has been laid, it's time to make official the new McNamara doctrine. It will not simply be an address to the nation like previous presidents have done to outline the foreign policy, but become ironclad law. We will use our democratic institutions to show the American enemies what they will soon be facing. I'll be quivering in my jackboots already. Cool. Four days, three days. Do we actually have nothing to pass? Uh, the CIA, political landscape. No, we have nothing to pass this time. That's interesting. Only one side you can pass stuff. Rolling up our sleeves, I guess. Because, why not? We did it once, we'll do it again. Maybe we'll get something... Oh, oh, now we're going to build... Th Ooh. Two C's plan, huh? That was under uh, MCS. Ooh, do we have enough here? 21 plus... Ooh, actually, 21 plus 21 is usually... 21 plus 42. We do not have enough. So, we'll read the event that when we fail... The, for the free act. So we do have another act here. But then, we'll read the event again... When we actually pass it, so... If you'd like to read about the free act, go right ahead. It's unfortunate we don't have enough support yet, but hey, whatever. Stay in the course. Oh, that's the, the one about the stuff. Oh, never mind. We pass it. I obviously can't read. 21, that's 40. Oh, duh. I can't read it. Anyways. After a rancorous debate in the Senate marked by widespread voting across party lines and McNamara administration's foreign relations and executive efforts actors passed in Congress, man, or in the Senate, the bill framed as a clarification and streamlining the president's powers to lead American diplomatic and defense policies has attracted extensive controversy. Not only was it the brainchild of an unprecedented bipartisan effort uniting McNamara's brain trust of advisors with the most hawkish elements within the NPP, its DOM provision, deployment overseas military, authorizes the <clears throat> limited deployment of American units overseas but as a pres at the president's discretion. The bill has had an unusual effect of uniting dovish segments of the NPP with the constitutionalists within the RDs in opposition to the bill concerned that the free act in the down provision would erode Congress's power to declare an oversee foreign conflicts in the pursuit of American or military adventurism overseas. The McNamara administration's backers have responded that nearly a decade after the German Civil War and the Japanese economic crash, America will need to implement or be able to quickly respond and decisively to new developments in order to secure its advantage in the Cold War, decisiveness or foolhardiness which gives you more, less division attrition, better supply consumption, and max volunteer force. Oh, I love interventionism. But regardless, that's all we got for Daddy or Bob McNamara. Hope you enjoyed this episode or this little video. If you did, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow in a different video. Thanks for watching. Have a great, great interventionist rest of your day.